Coming up on the social hour, Facebook hits 1 billion users and does some shady stuff. Plus, LinkedIn's key influencers. Who are they? And can you become one? Plus, use social flow for smarter posting. All that and an epic social fiasco on the social hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth provided by the new Winamp for Android, featuring wireless sync and one-click iTunes import. Now with free daily music downloads and full-length CD listening parties. Download it for free at winamp.com slash Android. Bandwidth for the Social Hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is The Social Hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur. Episode 80, recorded Thursday, October 4th, 2012. This episode of The Social Hour is brought to you by Social Media Solutions from SAP. If you're a social media manager at a large enterprise, gain insight and engage in social media in a systematic way with Social Media Solutions from SAP. Learn more at sap.com slash twit. And by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Social Hour. It is episode 80, a nice round number. From Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hello, Sarah. How has your week been? Very good, thank you. I'm trying to think of if there was anything really exciting that I did, and there isn't really. But it was very hot in San Francisco last weekend. Um, It was sort of our, well, it's the late summer that we always get around this time of year, and it was really only a couple of days, but so hot that that's all we could talk about. So the fog is back, and I'm very happy. Oh, yeah. We actually had a very foggy day in Toronto yesterday, and it reminded me so much of when I lived in San Francisco. And I just, I don't know, I love that weather sometimes. It's kind of cozy. It was a beautiful night last night. So uh, we haven't uh, dipped into uh, single digits so much yet as far as uh, the weather here, but uh, you can feel it's cooling down. But it's beautiful. It's a great time of year. All the leaves are starting to fall, and uh, it's fun for about the next month, and then it's horrible. (laughs) Unless you like scarves and gloves and mm-hmm. wellies and see you may socks. be thinking scarves like pretty scarves that are like accessories that you put on with your clothing yeah. but in the the dead of winter hair the scarves are a little bit thicker and <laughs> a little bit uh, more unattractive <laughs> because it does get quite cold but uh, I'm not going to complain it's all good and it's nice right now so that's all that counts there you go well you know what else counts is key influencers I, mm. I just, I was trying to get into it. That was a that. great segue, Sarah. <laughs> so seamless, like butter. Um, LinkedIn is actually allowing us to follow key influencers on the LinkedIn network. And what's interesting about this is before I had even read this uh, story, I got an email from LinkedIn uh, in uh, my personal, you know, Gmail account that I have, I have set up to connect to LinkedIn. If you look at it here, it says... Uh, subject line, read what Richard Branson and other thought leaders are saying on LinkedIn. And what's funny about this is I just about, you know, blew my lid because I had just spent a bunch of time in my LinkedIn notifications trying to finally stop getting email notifications. Oh. I'm in LinkedIn all the time. It's like, I don't need these email notifications and there's just too many of them. So I got this and I was like, what is happening? They refuse to stop emailing me, but this is a brand new feature. So it's yet another one that I have to turn off. But what's interesting is like, okay, I see Richard Branson here. I can go ahead and follow him right from the email. And then it's more people that I might like to follow. Uh, For example, the American president, Reid Hoffman, uh, Charlene Lee, Deepak Chopra, Tony Robbins. Okay, so there's quite an interesting mix of folks. Mm -hmm. Apparently, uh, the idea is that LinkedIn says right now it is choosing people uh, based on high quality content to be their first round of key influencers. And they say, if you're interested as a member, you know, if Amber, you say, I think I am influential. I use LinkedIn a lot. I think I'd be a good fit. You can submit your request to the company um, and then they might uh, include you in the next rollout. So it's not so much like a selective uh, suggested influencer list. Um, You can throw your hat in the ring, I guess, so to speak. 
the idea will be that um, it's sort of like a, a Facebook profile where someone subscribes to you, so they see your public stuff. Maybe you can lock down some of your more private information if you don't have a fully uh, public Twitter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, LinkedIn um, resume, you know, some, some of that stuff people keep locked down for a variety of reasons, or you lock down the ability for people to send you um, in-mail messages and that sort of stuff. But you can choose to selectively share some things with anybody who searches for you. It seems very Facebooky to me, um, but that's uh, a feature that I take advantage of on Facebook. I have, mm-hmm. I have a lot of public stuff that I share with whoever wants to read it. And I don't know, it works out well for me. Amber, what do you think? Is this good uh, territory for LinkedIn to get into? I think for me more and more in the past few months, I've actually found a lot of great content on LinkedIn. So instead of just connecting with people, I use it often to find interesting articles. So I think it makes sense that they want to connect with thought leaders out there. I found it a little bit hard to get back to the point where you found a listing of all these thought leaders. I don't think it's built very well into the primary navigation on LinkedIn. I actually had to go to their blog post on the topic and then link back to be able to get the list of uh, people who they consider thought leaders. Uh, Also, just for fun, like you mentioned, Sarah, you're able to submit yourself as a thought leader. And I just went through the process to do that right before the show because I had some time. And uh, it's interesting. If you do want to do that, uh, be warned that you do have to submit a few links of content that you've written, examples like a portfolio of some of your work. So clearly they're going after people who do create compelling content, uh, not just people who have some type of influence online. Because I think I had to submit at least two or four different writing samples, including some uh, video samples as well. So I thought that was kind of interesting that they get that specific to want to view some of your work. So uh, we'll see what happens. I'll keep you updated on that. Very easy process to go through that application if anyone wants to do it. Web2334 in our chat room says, thought leader is not a good name. I tend to agree. I just, I feel like, how can certain thoughts be leaders? It's just, it's, and, and someone else mentioned cloud. Yeah, because I think thought leader is a term that, you know, you can be dubbed on cloud if you have a certain score, a certain uh, variety of people that are following you. I I mean, I get it. I understand descriptively what thought leader is supposed to mean, but it does sound a little snobby. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it does too. I mean, I I wonder if eventually they'll break it into different categories because for most of the people, at least from the list that I viewed, it seems like they're choosing uh, a lot of business leaders, a lot of people who are in the digital marketing space. So it's very specific to uh, a certain industry. Uh, Obviously, they stray a little bit here and there, but uh, eventually I could see them having different lists as far as influencers or whatever they end up calling it, just like some of the other services have done. But I think it's interesting. Again, a lot of great content on LinkedIn. I'm finding more and more more really good posts that uh, I depend on in terms of my daily reading. So um, I think it's a good move. I, yeah, I do too. I do too. LinkedIn is, uh, they're expanding and that's, that's a good thing. Facebook mm-hmm. now, this is the part of the show where we talk about Facebook for most <laughs> of the show. No, I'm just kidding. Um, Facebook has more news than ever. Uh, the big news as of this morning is that Facebook has hit 1 billion users. Now that's not just oh, I signed up for an account uh, five years ago and now I'm counting as a user. This is active users. So I believe it's monthly active users, which means you have either logged into Facebook or used Facebook to log into a third-party service or used a service that uh, used Facebook uh, as as a comment mechanism in the last 30 days. So that said, 1 billion people using Facebook within the last 30 days is impressive. Wow. Yeah, that's an amazing number. Uh, uh, It's funny, I was thinking the other day about Facebook and this particular number because obviously they've been leading up to it for a while. And I wondered, even though they talk about perhaps one in seven people in the world belonging to Facebook, I wonder if we'll ever get to the point where there's another social network that launches in the next five years where it's one in every two people, right? Something that is even more common than Facebook. I mean, it seems like, oh my gosh, no one can do what they've done. But I I do think that, uh, you know, there, there could be others, maybe. Not MySpace, though. Right. Well, you know, MySpace is, MySpace is trying to come back, too, so we'll see. So Facebook got a billion users. It was interesting. There was a, um, an interview that uh, Mark Zuckerberg granted to Bloomberg where he answered a lot of questions about, you know, what one billion means to him. And, you know, he sort of famously plays stuff down and says, hey, we're, you know, we're a culture of engineers. It's just uh, status quo for us, and, and uh, you know, we're moving on to the next billion. But he did mention, hey, you know, five... Uh, five billion people have have uh, 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 mobile phones. 
you know, and one billion people are on Facebook, and that's clearly an area uh, that Facebook knows that they can grow in and they need to grow in. Uh, we've certainly oh, yeah. talked about that in the past, but that's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting how big of a market, a potential market, they still have yet to tap. And you think, so somebody's got a phone that can obviously access the Internet. Um, it has online capabilities, but they're not using Facebook yet. That's interesting. I mean, have they not heard of it? Have they decided that they're not interested? I mean, I'm sure it's a combination of, of both, but that's still a huge, huge chunk of the world uh, that, uh, that Facebook uh, can, try to, can try to gather up. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't know if we talked about this last week, but there was that story that came out. I think we might have spoken about it. Or maybe it was another show that I do where they mentioned that in the U.S., for example, Instagram mobile users had surpassed Twitter users for the very first time. Instagram really is not that old. So it's amazing to see how quickly they've been able to capture such a massive mobile audience and surpass a site like Twitter that's been around for a while. So uh, the mobile market is a totally different market. I totally agree that uh, uh, Facebook really has not done a great job there and there's an opportunity I think for someone to kind of step in and, and step up as well. Obviously they own Instagram so um, you know maybe that's their play. Who knows? Right. That's, it was all about those daily active users. They knew. They knew. Well I think it, you know that's interesting because I'm trying to think of do I ever go days without tweeting and you know more than I go days without uploading a photo to Instagram because I think that the numbers that were, where Instagram surpassed uh, Twitter was in daily active users. And no, for me, not. But I don't always, I mean, if you aren't looking at my actual profile Twitter stream, I do a mm -hmm. lot of replying to people. And that's not necessarily going to be public right. unless, you know, you're following both sides. So I do a lot of that. So I'm active on Twitter, but not so much throwing tweets out to the world. Just posting stuff. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree with that for sure. Now, this is an interesting story about Facebook uh, now letting United States states based uh, users to pay $7 to promote posts to their friends in their news feeds. We've talked about this before, the idea of promoted posts within the news feed. I don't think we've ever seen a precise number like $7 come out. I think it's uh, unbelievably high. I'm not sure I'm a big fan of uh, this offering that they're pushing out there because I think it kind of use all of the different content that's pushed out into the Facebook environment. What do you think, Sarah? Yeah, I'm with you. When I look at my news feed, uh, because I have my news feed, you know, you can, you can see it in sequential order if that's how, uh, that's how you want to um, say your options. But I like to feel like if there's something at the top, it might be recent, but it also might just be liked by a lot of my other friends. There's a whole... There's a whole waiting system that goes into the newsfeed, and I know that Facebook's been working on that for a while. So when I decide, okay, I haven't been on Facebook in a while, I'm, I'm just going to see what's new and interesting, I don't want to have to think about whether something was promoted, and that's why it's hanging out at the top. Now, I don't think, you know, that, that I'm going to be tricked into not knowing that something was promoted, but it's like, yeah, I just don't... I, I, I don't like to have that all be part of the deal because... It just skews our normal behavior. And also, $7 is, I mean, $7 is, it's a lot of money or it's, a, it's not a lot of money. I guess it just depends on what you're promoting. I mean, mm -hmm. if you've got a new book and you want to, um, not only are you proud of it, but you want to uh, sell as many copies as possible, then $7 probably isn't going to seem that much, you know? If you can end up selling 100 books and they're $20 each, and, you know, that's really, really worth it. And if you're a great friend of mine, then, yeah, I don't mind so much that, that that's what you threw at me, but... But uh, I don't know. It's, I, I think it's, it, it also means that some people will promote things probably more often than others. That's and, the problem. Yeah. I think. And it's, just, it's just like we don't all have equal behavior. Mm -hmm. I think exactly. In theory, perhaps it's a good idea. If you want to promote something, you have some type of business venture and you want a better opportunity to push it out there, it seems like a good idea. But when you're looking at some of the information, when it talks about rolling this out to people who have fewer than 5,000 friends and subscribers, it seems like they're not going after the audience of people who have large followings on Facebook. And so what I imagine is perhaps friends would use this and all of a sudden you may get a bunch of promoted messages like they, they say they want people to talk about 
garage sales and maybe apartments for rent. And all of a sudden, it's going to feel like an online classified site. And that's the thing that concerns me a little bit. I think just in terms of the implementation of what they're trying to do, I just don't see it being seamless. I think it could be a little bit irritating. Yeah, and, and, and it is going to be available to people with fewer than 5,000 friends and or subscribers. So you think, well, wait, what, why? And that's supposed to cut down on, you know, a brand, you know, Starbucks, for example, not eligible for something like this uh, because, the, well, I mean, the promoted post can be something else. Uh, uh, Starbucks can... can um, by advertising on, on Facebook in other ways. But this would not apply to a large brand like that that has a lot of likes, a lot of followers, a lot of subscribers, whatever. Um, so it's meant to be, hey, you know, somebody got engaged. Uh, that's really exciting. They say $7 is, is, means nothing. I just want as many people as possible to see this. I'm really excited about it. So mm. there's that. And it will be marked sponsored. Um, this, by the way, is something that rolled out, if you might recall, uh, back in New Zealand in May of this year. They called it Highlights. So this yeah. is, you know, it's just uh, it was sort of inevitable that it would eventually make it to the U.S. shores. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of interested to see who uses it, you know? Is it going to be my friends who are always throwing, you know, tech parties where there's going to be some sort of a cover at the door that's designed to raise money for something? Um, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I think uh, um, I, I, it's, it's worrisome somewhat, but uh, we'll see what happens as far as the execution. Uh, now, speaking of things that are worrisome on Facebook, Sarah, you had a link to this article about Facebook confirming it's scanning your private messages for links to increase like counters. And I'm guessing this is probably going to frighten a lot of people. This is the weirdest, um, but it's true because the next web spoke to Facebook and, and, and got clarification on what's going on. So here's the deal. There was a, there was a Polish startup called, uh, well, their URL is killswitch.me, that uh, had submitted a video to Hacker News saying, there, if you send a link, like if, if Amber and I, as friends on Facebook, I send her a private message, and in that private message, I have copied and pasted um, Alex's... Uh, you know, his his page for his band, right? As far as I know, Alex, you don't have a band, but let's just say that you did. <laughs> and I'm going like, oh my gosh, Amber, look at this. His band is so crazy. Look at their crazy outfits. That, that exchange will increase the number of likes on Alex's band page on Facebook. Now, whether or not that information is tied to me in any way is unclear. Well, it is tied to me as far as Facebook is concerned. But if that is the sort of information that could ever become public is mm. unclear and 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 yeah so that was something that was demonstrated and submitted to hacker news so it kind of went around and the next web said wait what this is crazy um the demo video of of this being sh shown was taken down off youtube it's still online somewhere else um and then facebook sent um, a response and said, we did find a bug recently with our social plugins where at times the count for the share or like goes up by two. We're working to fix this issue now. And the next web said, well, that's not really the issue that we're talking about. Um, <laughs> that it's, not, it's not going up by two. It's the fact that your actual private messages are being read for, for information that has to do with messages. So they asked for clarification. Facebook says... Absolutely no private information has been exposed. Facebook is not automatically liking any Facebook pages on a user's behalf. Many websites that use Facebook, Facebook's like, recommend, or share buttons carry a counter next to them. This counter reflects the number of times people have clicked on those buttons, also the number of times people have shared the page's link. When the count is increased via shares over private messages, no user information is exchanged. Privacy settings of content are unaffected. Links shared through messages do not affect the like count on Facebook pages. So it looks like um, it's sort of a privacy crisis averted, maybe somehow misunderstood. Um, Facebook then got in touch with them one more time just to make sure that everybody's clear and said... <laughs> Um, our systems parse the URL being shared in order to render the appropriate preview and also to ensure that the message is not spam. So, sh so <sighs> Facebook is scanning your private messages, right? I mean, if, if I send a link to Amber that's about anything mm. at all, Facebook is making a note of that. That's something that we should all keep in mind. 
but it hmm. should not be affecting Alex's band page. Yeah, so no likes on the pages will be affected. Right. I think it makes sense, obviously, though. I think it's going to do a little bit of damage to Facebook because I think it's confusing to people to try to understand how exactly it works. <laughs> and uh, just another issue with Facebook privacy, even if there has not been an issue with fri- privacy as far as uh, uh, from Facebook's uh, point of view and what they've done. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, good that uh, we don't have to, I guess, worry as much about that. I don't know. It still makes me uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable too, but at the same time, I figure, I mean, if anything that is noted as a hyperlink is shared anywhere in Facebook, I also assume that that's, I don't know, being recorded somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, not necessarily by some Facebook employee who's ready to learn more about me. I I don't really think of it in that way. I know some people in our chat room are saying, this is bad, this is bad. It's more of like, "Eh, you know, some robot somewhere marks like, URL, make it blue. Yeah. Uh, But, uh, but yeah, I just, it's a uh, kind of kind of par for course, really. Yep. All right. Uh, so uh, this week, a lot of people stayed up late to watch the first uh, presidential election for 2012, uh, myself included. So I know Sarah was uh, watching as well and tweeting up a storm. Uh, Twitter was pretty slow for me at times, I have to tell you. And I think it's based on what they revealed in this article that's on TechCrunch, that uh, this debate saw about 10.3 million tweets. And uh, they say it gave politics a new dimension. They talked a little bit about uh, what the impact was as far as some of the messages and uh, also tracking the debates uh, in Denver as far as uh, how many times they spiked in terms of the different conversation that was happening on Twitter. I mentioned before the show, Sarah, the thing that I I guess I can say impressed me the most is how quickly people reacted and and have reacted in the social media space when, uh, let's say, uh, presidential uh, candidate Mitt Romney had mentioned uh, potentially cutting uh, uh, the budget for Big Bird. And then all of a sudden, within minutes, you have people creating these Big Bird Twitter accounts and uh, these almost like parody accounts. Uh, So such an active community in some ways more interesting than the debate itself. It's funny. uh, I was um, invited by a friend. Uh, to come watch the debates at 7.30 Pacific time. And I said, uh, dude, you know, it starts at 6, right? And he said, well, I'll just, you know, tape delay it. You know, I'll, I'll DVR it and then we'll, you know, we'll watch when some other people can all come over and we'll make popcorn. And I was like, uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> it really doesn't. I need to be on Twitter. I need to be watching live. I mean, that's the whole, this is like one of those events that Twitter was made for because if somebody says something that's, uh, um, you know, if you get the zinger that you're looking for, then yeah, you know, everyone wants to talk about it, and you can't do that an hour and a half after the fact. It just, I don't know, it's not, it's not going to work. So um, that was that was uh, interesting to me. I actually did go to his house later. For everybody saying, well, that's very rude. He made you popcorn. I watched it twice actually, um, so I'm I'm well versed uh, in the debate by now. But I don't know. I kind of um, part of me thinks to myself. Well, um, when are we going to get to the point where we stop talking about how many users were on Twitter during the debate? You know, it's sort of like Twitter is just, it's running in the background all the time. I mean, isn't that just obvious? But I do Mm -hmm. think that there's so much um, of knowledge that we can get from why certain parts of shows spike when they do. And that, I mean, Twitter is the perfect indicator for that. We know that... You know, when uh, Jim Lair told Mitt Romney, let's not talk about something because they were sort of derailing, that a lot of people got a lot out of that and they either ran to Twitter or did some searches or that sort of thing. So, you know, maybe not for the general public, but there are people where that kind of information is really, really important, um, yes. especially when you're, you know, in a, in a campaign <clears throat> like this. And I don't, I, I don't know. It's, uh, it's not surprising to me. It was, it, was a, it was a big night for social media last night. It Although sure I was. do. Um, I think. Oh, go ahead. Almost even more interesting than this, Sarah. I don't know if you had a chance to take a look at what the New York Times was doing because they were fact-checking live while the debate was happening. And they had reporters who were fact-checking things that uh, the different uh, candidates were saying. And uh, I think, you know, whether you agree with what they were saying or not, the reality is I think that's almost more interesting is all of a sudden you have people out there who in real time are adding that context, that layer to the information that Mm -hmm. is presented on television. And to me, that's more interesting than 
comment any tweet that was sent out there because they're investigating and doing more reporting. So I think it was fun to watch that as well. Absolutely. I had a friend who um, she wasn't able to watch the debate until later either. And she started tweeting. You know, she was, I don't know, traveling or in a meeting or something. She started tweeting, OK, this Big Bird thing better be funny. I mean, Mitt <laughs> Romney better like walk out there in a Big Bird suit and, you know, juggle while on one foot you know, doing jumpy jacks or something, like, based on what was, like, Twitter, you know, how Twitter, like, people start feeding off of each other, and so then people mm-hmm. get silly, and it turns into these, you know, parody accounts, and it's, like, if, you, if you're not actually there live in real time, and that's the kind of funny thing, is you sort of see this coming in, and you go, what happened? I know. And you watch it later, and you're like, that's it? That's it? it? Gosh, you're making too much out of nothing, but that's not really the point. The point wasn't to exaggerate it, it's just kind of, like, it turns into its own beast, which is, mm-hmm. the, you know, the, the fun thing about Twitter. It's kind of interesting when we all have all of these services, these television services to watch anything that we want on demand, that there still is something so attractive about the whole live experience. And especially, like you said, when you have that social media element, I mean, there's still so many things that you want to be able to watch live and participate in live. And uh, that definitely was one of those things. So uh, uh, it was a fun night for sure. Absolutely. So that is our news segment. Don't worry, though. We've got all sorts of other stuff. We've got social tips. We've got spotlights. We have some of your viewer feedback. But quick reminder uh, for all of you live viewers, um, we usually record the show Fridays at 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. We're doing it on Thursday night. Uh, Amber was nice enough to change her schedule around a little bit. For me, over the next two weeks, uh, if you want to watch live next week and you're not watching live right now, Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, That's what we're doing now and what we're going to do next week. But if you don't watch us live, or for some reason you can't, and that's not a good time for you, don't worry about it. You won't miss a thing. In fact, you almost get a more polished version of the show pretty much uh, within a couple hours of us finishing it. Um, The social hour at Twit. I'm sorry, twit.tv slash TSH is where you see all of our past episodes. All of our episode archives live here. Um, this is also where you subscribe to the show. So if you say, yeah, Sarah, I don't, uh, I'm not able to watch live or that doesn't work for me, but I'd like to just not think about it at all. This is almost like DV- DVRing our show. You just say, I want to schedule every time there's a new show. I want you to record that. And then... Uh, you can record it, you know, via iTunes or pretty much your podcaster of uh, podcatcher of choice. That's really, really simple. That's actually probably the best way to watch or listen to the show. We have audio and video feeds. Uh, but that's those are your options if you don't already know about them. And we also have links to everything that we talk about on every show in those show notes. You see Alex is scrolling down right down at the bottom of the page. <laughs> everything that we talk about that's linkable, we link to there. So it's easy to follow along after the fact. Okay, before we get into some of our other goodies, let's take a moment to thank SAP for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. The deal with uh, social media, as we were talking about, is so much happens on social media. I mean, the whole Twitter conversation is, is, is a whole different animal uh, than anything else. Um, but that's not the only place that people are conversing. People are talking to, uh, about brands directly to brand accounts. Brands are there trying to make... Um, the conversation better with their consumers, potential customers. So when someone posts a comment to Facebook or a blog or sends a tweet and you work in social media for a large company, a large enterprise, you got to know about that. I mean, you have to have a handle on it. You have to make sure that that correspondence is being routed to the right person. If it's not you, you need to figure out who it should go to and have sort of an automated process because if you work at a big enough company, this is not something that you can just sit down and respond to a few people about. So social media solutions from SAP might be the solution for you. It helps large enterprises listen and engage with social media in a systematic way. They have two components that are kind of interesting, the listening component and the engaging component. The listening component does things like captures conversations that have relevant terms that your company might be looking for, help to build better products by incorporating real-time customer feedback into your efforts, whatever you're innovating for. It helps you identify customers who are like, you know, they were on the fence before, but now they're ready to buy based on those buying signals that people send via social media. You know, if they were sitting in front of you, you might know how to close the sale, but on social media, it's a whole different thing. And it's smart because the uh, software uses natural language processing to make a difference between, let's say, I say, 
I've never been angry at this company. They've always been great. Um, or I could say I've never been so angry at this company because they're so terrible. I mean, there are a lot of the same keywords there, but I'm saying two very different things. That's where SAP really comes in handy. It's intelligent. Then that engaging component is a whole other thing. So you can improve customer service by allowing, uh, it helps you set the rules about who gets this message. So if there's a message with certain keywords that has a certain kind of uh, indicator, maybe it goes to John because John handles that sort of thing. So it helps me be more efficient by not having to be the middleman. Somebody tweets a tech support problem, maybe that's something that you can help them with, maybe not, you can get it off to the right person, fix their problem through social media, which is why that they went to social media in the first place. So you end up using social media, maybe somebody goes there to vent, and then you're there to fix. That's mm -hmm. sap.com slash twit. If this sounds like something, you work for an enterprise, you've got a social media department, and you're not using this that you might want to know about. Again, sap.com slash twit. That's their social media solutions solution. And we thank them so much for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. And Sarah, when we get to our campaign spotlight of the week, you'll see why software, like you just mm. mentioned, from SAP is so important, <laughs> especially with the multiple accounts and managing oh, people who yeah. are actually out there and touching some of the content that you push out into the social stream. So uh, really important. Yeah, our campaign spotlight of the week is a real doozy. But we'll get to it, sure that in a few <laughs> it sure is. It sure is. So first up, we have we our social media tip of the week. And this is great for people who are out there and they're looking for work. I haven't heard of the site before. Uh, I hate to say that it's called Twit Job Search. And I'm sure Leo would hate to hear this as well. Uh, but uh, nothing to do with twit.tv. However, it does have a lot to do with Twitter. The idea being with the service, uh, you can go in there, you can log in with your account, and you can search for jobs that are posted on Twitter. Uh, it was kind of fun. You know, I put in a few search terms and um, I found some good postings that people had pushed out into the uh, Twitter space. And uh, as w much as LinkedIn and some of these services are great for going out and job hunting, it's nice to use a combination of different tools. And I think this is a pretty good simple one uh, that can only enhance the job hunting process. Yeah, I love this. It's a fun I think one. It's great. Except that it's called Twit Job Search. I know. But I, Leo's in the background moaning, Twit Job Search. Let's show him. But, uh, but, but, well, I mean, it wouldn't be the first company to say that. You but know, the weird thing is they have a quote from Leo, I think, on the homepage. No. Twit job Something. search? You should look into it because that's one of the reasons I was like, oh, I guess it's okay to talk about it because I think they had Leo Laporte's name at the top of the homepage. So I thought maybe he covered it. Do you see it there? He, um, no, he calls it a Web 3.0 company. I do not. <laughs> he's, he's yelling and that's saying, okay. no. That's not what I said. Have you never heard of Twit Job no, Search? That they're doing that. Uh, they're really? They're doing that for to game it. They want to <gasps> game in Twit. To See, I wouldn't have included it, it's but totally I thought Leo had mentioned it. I was like, oh, I guess. Company. It's certainly not a Web 3.0. Have you ever heard me say anything is a Web 3.0 company? No. I don't know. No. Well, it's infuriating. You do a lot of talking. Are you sure you didn't say this? Liars! Okay. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> if anyone can find a clip where Leo says that this is a Web 3.0 company, please let us know. Well, you say you haven't heard of it, but sometimes you say that. But, um, <laughs> all right, well. like a married couple. <laughs> Stop yeah. fighting, okay? Exactly. I do agree. I've never heard Leo say Web 3.0. Uh, that <laughs> seems like that a, a, a safe bet. I don't know what that means either. But uh, I'm, gr I'm glad I brought it into the uh, spotlight for this weekend. Uh, I'm sure uh, it'll be uh, lead to an interesting conversation. A job uh, maybe search engine for Twitter. Hey, you know, if you need a job, the whole naming convention probably is the least, the last thing on your mind, right? Yes. And a lot of people are looking for work. So it's always good for us to have... Is, is he yelling still? He is yelling. Remember, we're using our lavaliers over here, so... I'm mad! Yeah, you're mad. Well, be mad quietly, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I like Leo oh, I popping up Thursdays. in the show now and again. It always makes it interesting. No, maybe, we should, maybe it can be a weekly Leo cameo. He's been doing it more and more lately. Just walking in, just yelling. Yeah. Hey, so awesome. uh, let's, uh, that's the social tip. Twitjobsearch.com if you want to see Leo's non-quote for yourself. <laughs> uh, let's move on into our spotlight. Uh, this is a product called Social Flow. 
Yes. So this is not as extensive as when you're talking about uh, SAP and the software that they offer. This is more for people who are pushing tweets out. Maybe you're using services like Hootsuite and you want a smarter way to be able to send those messages out. It's just a simple service. And one of the things they do well, I thought I'd mention it. My brother uh, had a chance to talk to them and said it was really cool, is they allow you to figure out the right time to post messages in the social media world, meaning that when you're scheduling tweets, they will plan on when those tweets go out. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you want to send out a Twitter message. Let's say you have a bakery and you want to send out a tweet at the point where the most people are talking about uh, eating uh, and cooking and baking and those type of things. It will analyze and figure that out and then give you an appropriate time to send that message out. So a really simple thing, simple idea. I know they do other things, but specifically wanted to talk about that that one uh, feature and, uh, and piece of the project in terms of what they do. Yeah, this is cool. I, I, I mean, this, this looks like it's well designed. Mm-hmm. They've got a lot of options. Um, whether, I mean, depending on what kind of platform you're running or what you're interested in. Um, if you're interested, you can go ahead and request a demo. Yeah, you pretty much basically give them a little information about yourself, where you work, how to get a hold of you, social media goals. This is all stuff where, it's, it, you know, it's possible if you, if you do this for a living, you have heard of social flow before, but if you haven't, um, it, it's, I don't know, w- without having um, actually used this, uh, it certainly looks promising. I think it's interesting too, you know, you had mentioned uh, before some of the uh, services out there like SAP that are getting smarter all the time. They're able to analyze ang- language and figure out uh, sentiment and those type of things. So it's fun to watch some of these social services just get that much smarter and to be able to, um, again, just give people more information so that when they're doing social media campaigns or they're trying to engage, they know the appropriate time, place and method in terms of how they should do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, they've gotten quite a bit of uh, press uh, mm-hmm. recently. They've got um, some some different products. Um, GigaOM wrote about uh, Crescendo, which is uh, what they call an attention buying platform for Facebook. It's a tool that helps uh, buy ads on Facebook, understanding the conversations that brands fans are having, and then buying up low cost keywords that correspond to the discussion. So it's intelligent advertising. Again, if if that's uh, what you're in the business of doing, uh, which is certainly can be beneficial uh, when you leverage Facebook that way. Socialflow.com. Cool. All right. So it looks like we have some really good feedback this week from our viewers and listeners. Uh, first up, uh, we have an email from Chris Christensen. He said, uh, in Social Hour 78, you were talking about business cards and one of the problems being that two weeks later, you don't know or remember who you were talking to. One thing that helps is the Card Munch app now by LinkedIn that scans the card and gets the info off the card and then looks at the email on LinkedIn so that it can pull in the LinkedIn data, including a photo. Uh, I think we've talked about this on the show before. I use Card Munch and absolutely love it. It's a great little app. Yeah, in fact, we we have kind of uh, complained a little bit about uh, business cards being a little archaic and it's nice to have everything digital in the first place, but doesn't uh, change the fact that people will give you business cards, especially um, if you go to conventions or, you know, larger meetings. It's just, this is an easy way that uh, that people want to be remembered. Um, but if someone gives me this card and I've got the Card Munch app, for example, Alex, if you can take my iPad, let's see if I can do a respectable demo here. Um, all right, so here's my iPad. I've got Card Munch open. This is an iPhone app, by the way. You can see I've just, I've just got it blown up a little bit. Actually, it's probably better in its native because it's looking at a small uh, business card. But then I hold, oops, uh, where am I? Oh, yeah, okay. I hold my business card up and I kind of just try to keep it as centered as possible. Let's see if I can do this. Oh, it's weird because I want to actually hold it in the middle of the iPad, but the but the iPad camera is over on the upper right hand side, so I'm I'm almost feeling like I'm doing this backwards. There we go. <laughs> uh, oh, wait. Oh, I see. I'm forgetting to take a picture. This is really diff- Do you guys get the idea? <laughs> you guys get the idea. Um, the idea is that you take a picture, then it can input the data, you know, kind of how uh, your bank teller machine can read a check. And you go, how do you do that? You know, it's because they have computers that can, that can pull out that sort of information. And then, yes, I'm scanning my own business card, which is silly, but it would match the information that I have on LinkedIn 
that is, uh, you know, if anybody but me was scanning this and they are LinkedIn contacts of mine, then all of a sudden in their local contacts, they've got a bunch of information for me. They've got my phone number and this and that and stuff that was shared on my, uh, on my business card and then um, merges that with LinkedIn information. So now if Amber has met me for the first time and she's got the stuff, she knows a lot more about me and, and what my skills are and what company I work for and all that good stuff. So yeah, good it's really tip, easy to Chris. use. And it's free. It's a free app. So it's kind of it's just a nice thing to have um, on, on, your, uh, on your smartphone. Or again, you can use it on your tablet as well. Got any, another email from Marlon uh, who says, uh, our biggest fan from Jamaica. So I I hope that's true. Marlon says, I have a number of places that I socialize on the web. I've got uh, Local Spice Jamaica. That's a seasoning company that I'm part owner of. I've got my personal Twitter account. I've got my personal blog. I run it on WordPress.com. I'm on Pinterest. I'm on Foursquare, Instagram, Google+, all of that stuff. With that said, I use MarlonStewart.com as my contact page. Is there a software or website or plug-in, some sort of a solution that I can use to aggregate all of those various feeds into one place, stream it on my domain, so my friends can just go to that one place for all of my information and updates? So I thought about this, and there are a variety of blogging platforms, um, really just website hosting platforms, uh, that could be a solution for you, Marlon. I mean... Squarespace is a frequent sponsor on the show, and that's one of the things that I always tell people that's so cool about it is that if I was to build sort of a SaraLane.com, well, that's actually exactly what I've done, even though it's a little bit out of date right now. SaraLane.com, go there, and that's where you get links to everything. That would be a great way to do it, and the new Squarespace has some uh, dynamic ways to keep all that stuff um, updated without you having to actually manually update anything regularly but i also thought amber about dot me is sort of perfect for this um, oh you're in, right yeah in the same way i mean i've got an about dot me page so it's about me.com slash sarah lane if you want to uh follow along and what i've done is i have linked a bunch of my social media accounts um and i didn't like have to get creative about like getting some clip art for Instagram or whatever. This is all just built in to the about.me settings. But then let's say I also, and oh, and the neat thing about this, Marlon and everyone else is, it's not just going to link me to Instagram. If I go ahead and click that Instagram icon, you now see my latest posts from Instagram. And I can go back in time quite a bit. And then if you, if you click on a particular photo, Oh, that's Frank and Trish at their wedding. You see how many people liked it, comments. If I click on the photo again, then that'll take me to the permalink of the Instagram page. But I think, Marlon, for your purposes, that's cooler than just providing some Instagram link because it is dynamic and it is updating alone. Um, for links that might not be built in um, to what uh, in, uh, to, to About Me offers, and I noticed that when I went to edit my page here, and I said, um, let's go ahead and add an app, an app that I haven't added yet. I went through my options. You have a lot of them. Vimeo, Daily Booth, Last FM, stuff that I haven't added yet, GitHub. I don't see Pinterest on here, but I can still add Pinterest because I can add a custom link. So all of this stuff down in the lower left-hand side, like that's the URL for i5 for the iPhone, for TNT, iPad Today, Social Hour, here's my personal blog. So you could add something and call it whatever you want, like follow me on Pinterest or that sort of thing. So those links will take you to a direct uh, destination. But it seems like you've got a lot built in here. And uh, I like about.me, flavors.me, uh, which, which Moo acquired and Amber, you and I talked about in our business card discussion on a recent <laughs> show is, is another option. But this seems like maybe a good place to at least fool around and see if it's the right solution for Marlon. Yeah, it definitely seems like a good... And it's easy, right? Like you said, it's so simple to set up. Very you can do it easy. in it. So yeah. that's always a, an attractive benefit to that. Agreed. Um, so Sarah, on last week's show, we were talking about the Twitter profile makeover, the header makeover specifically. And uh, one of our viewers or listeners, uh, Rapid Andy, had uh, created a header that was pretty slick. I believe it was him. And he also had sent us um, a, some type of response as far as our uh, viewer and listener feedback. And it looks like he has something else for us this week. Yeah, it's, it's true. He, um, uh, Rapid Andy had, yeah, he, he had sent us 
a way to, um, God, it's the end of the day. I start always start losing my words. QR code and Instagram account. So it's something that you could add to, you know, again, that landing page, your blog, whatever. So if someone scans it, then they get uh, with their smartphone or tablet or whatever, they get um, taken over to your Instagram account because Instagram accounts don't have it, an online presence on the web. And it's funny because we talked about it and we said, yeah, thank you. That's really cool. And um, he has quite a few followers on Instagram. And on Instagram, he sent a note and he at replied us. So I saw that. So it was sort of like he was thanking us with an Instagram. But then he had sort of a better idea for how we could be on Instagram. So we'll go ahead and play his video. Hey, Amber and Sarah. Last week, I sent you a video about how to link to your Instagram account in the Instagram app from the web. But what about if you want to do it the other way around? Because Instagram don't let you have um, embeddable links. In fact, the only link you can have is on your profile that's clickable. So it got me thinking that, well, really, every brand or every show should have its own Instagram account just so that you can point to it. So I was able to say I was on at the social hour last week and it has your URL so people can go and check you out. And I guess that's my tip. If you're a brand, a business, have an account on every platform so that you, A, you've secured your name just in case you ever want to use it. And B, your stakeholders or viewers or fans or whatever have somewhere to point at and visit and refer people to, especially in something like Instagram, where there's only really that way of doing it. So, uh, yeah, this is for you. Do what do with it what you will. It's my gift to you. And thank you very much. I've been... <laughs> Rapid A N D I, thanks. He's so cute. He's uh, great. Thanks, Rapid A N D. I actually am now following him on Instagram, and he has. I mean, I I want to believe that you're taking all those pictures with a camera phone. It's hard to believe it because they're so good, but. Mm -hmm. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I went ahead and looked us up on Explore. Um, of course, I'm running Instagram again on my iPad, so it's just just a, a larger version of the iPhone app. But sure enough, if you go ahead and search for the social hour as a user, there we are. And he's smart enough to have actually added nine. Those are actually nine photos. Isn't that funny? So it looks really, really cool. Fun. I know. Now, Andy, three followers. Hey, look at that. I'm one of them. <laughs> By the way, I gotta follow. I gotta follow us. <laughs> I gotta follow us too. You know, Amber, you and I have both talked about how uh, this isn't always what we recommend to people, um, especially if you work for a company, you're building up a presence, and you want to keep your own presence separate. Maybe you're not going to be working there forever. It can get a little tricky. But I do see Andy's point, especially when it comes to he's got a lot of followers on Instagram, and he was saying, "Hey, I was I was on the show, and it's like." It's kind of hard to explain for a lot of people who he might be connected hmm. to on a network that just they they don't know us yet. They don't know who we are. So he could connect to our Instagram accounts. But there's not a whole lot of very obvious information about the social hour on either of our accounts. So I think in this case, he makes a really good point that even if you don't have to be there monitoring it all the time, it might be a good idea at least to consider making an account that at least has the URL of you know, where the company um, lives online, which this account does. And you kind of cover your bases. Yep. Yeah. And uh, like you mentioned, make sure that someone else doesn't necessarily squat there and uh, uh, try to pretend they're you or your company. So I think it's a good idea. He's so creative. I mean, uh, we had mentioned his Twitter profile header and uh, the fun that he had with that image where he almost took his own head off and had an iPad. It's very interesting. But uh, he does such a great job of all of this stuff. So really fun to have him contribute again to the show. Absolutely. So are you ready to get into our campaign spotlight of the week, Amber? Oh, yes, I am, actually. Um, so this is, like you said, is a bit of a doozy. Uh, some people have probably heard about this uh, during the debate uh, just recently with uh, the presidential candidates. Uh, it was kind of interesting because there was a bit of a, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but a Twitter fiasco happening in KitchenAid's world. So if you follow KitchenAid, you may have noticed that uh, someone there had sent out a tweet from the corporate account and uh, this is what the tweet said. It's kind of horrific. Uh, it said uh, <clears throat> Obama's GMA, he means grandmother, uh, even knew it before um, 
it, it was going to be bad. She died three days before he became president. So uh, basically insulting President Obama, saying that uh, his grandmother had passed away because before he became president because she knew what was going to happen. I mean, just a terrible thing to come out from anyone, let alone a corporate account like KitchenAid. So you can imagine how quickly this spread. Um, I guess the only good news about this was how quickly uh, there was a response that had gone out. And basically another example of an individual at a company who had tweeted thinking uh, that uh, they were tweeting from uh, their own personal account and got mixed up and went out on a corporate account. Oh, this is my worst nightmare. So what are they using, mm-hmm. like TweetDeck or, well, who knows? I mean, you can you can just do this by accident. Um, you know, I've actually done this before, Amber, and nobody realized it because I have a few, well, I don't have a few. I have one or two sort of Twitter accounts that I don't publicize. Okay. And there was one point where it's not, I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know. They're almost like just little test accounts, really, more than something that's controversial. But there was uh, a point where I was very angry with a brand, and I went to say to that brand, like, hey, I, you know, this, this terrible thing happened, and your customer service hung up on me, and that's two hours, I'll never get back, that kind of thing. And the customer service rep gets back to me, but I don't see it for a while because I realize, oh, shoot, I was logged in on that other account, and, like, I don't want anybody to see that, oh, no. you know, that, that was not what I meant to do. So it's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an honest mistake, but when you are working for a huge brand like KitchenAid, I mean, KitchenAid mm-hmm. is, I mean, they're, they're not some, like, joke brand. They're a huge uh, kitchen and, you know, uh, I mean, what do you even call them? You know, homewares, they have expensive products. I mean, the whole thing is, like, that is not okay. And, yes, I agree with you that if you were to read this tweet in any context, you'd go, oh, what poor taste. How yeah. awful. You know, that's just so unnecessary to say about anybody and somebody's grandmother and, you know, especially somebody who's passed on. But for it to come from KitchenAid, it's like, it's obvious exactly what happened. You know, it's clear what happened. But I wonder if that person still has a job. You know, do you get forgiven when you go, Oop, whoops, tweeted too quick. I'm sorry. I don't know. This is pretty bad. Like you said, I think it's really in poor taste as well. It's just completely inappropriate. Uh, And you have to wonder with this person, if I was sending out a tweet like that, which I never, ever would, uh, the first thing I would be thinking is if I was using an account that was tied to other accounts through some type of social media dashboard, I would be very careful about not sending it out through the uh, corporate account. So, uh, uh, you know, I think a big issue for KitchenAid and uh, another example of social media gone wrong very quickly for a corporation. Bad news. The bad one. Yeah, they apologize however they could, and uh, nobody will talk about this in a few more days. But again, yes, uh, probably something that that employee uh, will never do again. Or if they do, then we've really got a problem. Yeah, let's hope, Sarah. <laughs> let's hope. We love hearing from you. You know, we've got somebody in chat room saying, well, you guys reacted very, you know, ooh, to the video from Rapid Andy. And it's because we love getting videos. Videos are awesome because we see you guys and gals and dogs and anybody who watches <laughs> or listens to or enjoys the social hour every week. It's really, really nice when we get feedback from you. Even, you know, if you're happy or sad, you got a bone to pick with us. Bring it on. You can write us at the social hour at twit.tv. You can leave us a voicemail at 2626 social. Just spell out the word social. 2626 S O C I A L. You can record a video. Um, Andy Andrew, I think his name is, uh, had uh, put his up on YouTube. Send us the link. Easy as pie. Um, or uh, Amber and I both, we don't actually have an official the social hour Twitter account. Although maybe at this point we should think about it, at least to send send uh, people to our uh, personal accounts. But if you have anything that you'd like to contribute to the show and you want to tweet at either Amber Mack or Sarah Lane, do that on Twitter. We're always listening and always taking notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, thanks yeah, I've been using uh, the social hour hashtag as much as I can recently just to try to group some of those. Conver- I know it's a little bit long, but uh, that's also another option too. I'll try to keep searching for that one. Absolutely. All right, before we get to Amber's rad or fad, which is always my favorite part of the show, let's take a moment to thank Audible for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. Audible.com is the place, the place to get the most downloadable titles of audiobooks your heart could ever desire, over 100,000 of them. I mean, think about that for a second. Think of 100,000 books. That's a very, very, very large library, right? And that's all at your disposal. So if you're the kind of person who either likes listening to stories being read to you 
Um, Leo uh, mentioned that uh, John Hodgman he has a bunch of audiobooks that are great because he reads his own books. I mentioned Do John Hodgman because he was a guest on uh, another Twitch show, Triangulation, uh, which aired yesterday. And it's really, really funny because he's a funny guy. That sort of thing. You can do nonfiction. You can do fiction. There are a variety of periodicals that are on offer as an audiobook as well. So you've really got a lot of options. And if you're a busy person, so maybe you say, I don't know, audiobooks, that sounds great. Um, but... I don't know, I, I read just fine. Well, I read just fine too, but I get tired really easily. <laughs> and I run out of time during the day, or I'm on the go, and you can't be reading while you're driving. I mean, that's just not possible. I can't even really read um, when I'm working out, because, you know, if I'm running, I, you know, I get sort of like almost seasick trying to read the pages on a, on a, in a book. So audiobooks really come in handy in, in so many ways. And if you're in a hurry... You know, one X. We all we're all kind of used to this now. Is like that's like normal speed. But maybe you really got to get to the end of a chapter, and so you can speed up the the words a little bit. You know, go up to three X or something. So you power through that book a little bit quicker. Maybe you got to cram for your next book club. I don't know. What's nice is that Audible gives you a lot of options, and once you have books, you have them forever. So they're just like a you know an ebook library really. But they're audiobooks. They're really really cool. What's nice is that if you've got um, you know an iPad or an iPhone or an Android device or uh, via the web. I mean, you can access Audible content a variety of ways. So it makes it really easy to, if you've got some time, you get through some of that audiobook, you pick it up later on another device, not a problem. What's really, really cool, though, this is the best part, is that you can download a free audiobook if you sign up for audiblepodcast.com slash social hour. Basically, you just... Try it free for 30 days. Go ahead and get started. You choose your audiobook. Then if you, uh, then if you go ahead with an account, that audiobook is not something you have to give back or anything. It's just yours. And you just start off with that book. And you don't have to give it back if you decide not to purchase. So it's really a great way to just give Audible a try. See if it's right for you. See if it's something that you need to be incorporating into your life so that you're reading more. We should all be reading more. And if you can't read, then you can... Read uh, via active listening. Again, that's audiblepodcast.com slash social hour to get that free audiobook and get yourself started into the audiobook universe. Okay, Amber, let's get into <laughs> this week's Rad or Fad. Okay, so uh, first up, a little bit of a backstory here, Sarah. I will tell you that initially when I read this headline, I was thinking to myself, is this April 1st and is this a joke? But then I kept finding the headline across multiple social media sites, on news sites as well, like the BBC. It looks as though this is true. Um, many people are familiar with Simon Cowell, who, of course, is behind The X Factor, uh, was behind uh, American Idol. Uh, Simon Cowell and Will I Am ha are coming together to launch a new project. This will be The X Factor for tech. The idea being that they are going to come together and create this project to focus on tech stars, entrepreneurs, in order to find the next Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. And uh, not a lot more information than that. Uh, did get a lot of play. Um, like I said, initially kind of thought it was a joke. Um, and is this rat or fad, Sarah? I uh, think it's kind of cool, but I don't know. I mean, I guess it, how, it depends how it plays out. So I have heard about this. Um, Tom Merritt floated the idea by me the other day, and I, I think in general, I mean, I love the idea of people with brilliant ideas, especially in the tech sector, because there are a mm -hmm. lot of them, being able to get in front of other people who can help them realize their dream. So, you know, in a, in a conceptual way, I kind of like this. As far as, if anyone's familiar with the X Factor, I mean, it's, it's sort of glitzy, glamoury. It's about millions of people, you know, finding the next big Whitney Houston type voice type of a thing. So that is the sort of uh, show that works really well in a network, right? Because someone <laughs> sings and you go, oh my gosh, this person is amazing. Make them win. I care. I care. Sometimes when somebody has a great tech idea, you, you hear a pitch and you go, eh. Yeah. Like, maybe that sounds good, but, I mean, the execution might be a nightmare. Like, what's your server, uh, you know, set up? Or how are you going to get that? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a, sometimes uh, great ideas are just more complicated than hearing some, gr some great idea. Yeah, so, I agree. So, in, I don't know if it sounds like it's a very exciting show. 
<laughs> well, it could be, Sarah, but then you imagine all I see is this young tech entrepreneur. I mean, obviously it could be male or female picturing someone in a hoodie and like you said, not maybe as glamorous as some of the people who are out there on The X Factor, American Idol and some of those other shows. Um, I think selfishly, the reason I would put it in kind of the rad category is just because I want to see it. <laughs> I want to see how they may do something like this. And I think it could be a total train wreck. It could completely bomb. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I do think it's good to put technology and like you said, some ideas into the spotlight. And this is one way to do it. Although I think it's very difficult as uh, you know, and Leo and anyone else who's tried to do technology on TV, it's very difficult, I think, for broadcasters to understand how to convey technology on television and how to talk about it because they think it's just, it's not that exciting. There's a lot of screens. It's difficult to make it interesting and sexy. So if Simon Cowell can do it, maybe that's a good thing for all of us. Well, you know, they're starting a reality show about Silicon Valley on Bravo any day now. I'm not exactly sure when it, when it airs, but that's happening. Maybe it's really hot to talk about brilliant young startup entrepreneurs that have <laughs> these great ideas and, you know, hit the pavement and never sleep and drink a lot of Red Bull. I don't know. I still <laughs> think it sounds like a good X Factor show. But Will I Am is, I mean, he's he's cool. He's he's always got his hand in something interesting. I mean, he's... Yes. He's... he's uh, He's he's a pretty creative guy. Simon Cowell knows how to make a hit show. So who he does. knows? Maybe we're maybe we're not thinking um, outside of the box enough for why this would be extremely exciting. I worry that there'd be a lot of like, you know, the flashiest people get mm -hmm. more attention, or there's the um, there's the worry that if somebody has a really bad idea, mm -hmm. then they get made fun of because that's what they do on these shows. You know, they just sort of okay. like do like that. You know, the background of the person who really has no singing talent, and then they get up yeah. there and they're terrible, and everybody laughs, which is kind uh, of. On the other hand, if you look at it, one of my favorite shows is Shark Tank, which I watch all the time. I'm a big fan of that show with uh, Mark Cuban. Uh, actually, there's a couple other guys on the show who are originally from Canada who did a show here called Dragon's Den. And uh, the idea of uh, business and entrepreneurship and pitching ideas. So I think you're right. I think if the approach is like the X Factor and it's sexy and flashy, that's not going to work. But if they go to more towards kind of the business and ideas in terms of how they've done with Shark Tank, which has been a huge hit show over the past past year, then they could have some success because people love watching the pitches and seeing people succeed. And um, it'll be interesting to see how they uh, they do with this. But we'll keep our eyes on it and uh, it'll be fun to watch, you know, even as they figure out who the judges and the panel and all those people are going to be too. I mean, look at The Apprentice. Is that, still, is that show still on? I mean, it was certainly a success. It's not just about tech, but I mean, so much about um, building, a, you know, successful tech business. Mm -hmm is business. I mean, it's just, you know, there's just a tech angle. I mean, even if you're like a crazy inventor and you're not interested in yeah. business at all, that has to be part of the roadmap at some point. Um, you know, even if you don't build it, some, you're going to have to partner with somebody who wants to do that part of it. So yeah, yeah you know, maybe it'll be rad. Yeah. I'm going to be optimistic Leo's, about it. Leo should be a judge. Yeah, he should. He'd he go, should. He I would be a great it. judge. I hate you. I never said that. <laughs> I hate you. No, you know what he'd do? He'd go, oh, that's... Oh. What? That is so good. That is so good. Oh, I love it. And then you turn around and go, I hate it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's my Leo. You never know, though. You never know if they came to him, Sarah. You know, offered him a great opportunity, and we could put his name in the hat. I think if any of us are offered judge spots on X Factor, we should take them. We got to do it. We got to do, do it. Do <clears> it. <throat> uh, sitting next to Simon Cowell, I would not say no to that. I <clears throat> like that guy. <clears throat> He's mm -hmm. fun. He's fun. All right, Amber, we've come to the end of our hour. Um, I think we, we stuck to about an hour, a little bit over. Uh, so thanks to everybody who yeah. stuck with us. Uh, remember that uh, normally we're live uh, Fridays, 4 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Pacific. This week and next, we're going to be shooting a day early, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Amber, thank you so much uh, for staying up till 7 p.m. to do the show with me. I know how no you like problem. to turn in early. <laughs> yes, I'm normally in bed by now. Not so much. <laughs> or at least putting into it. your dinner hour. So thank you for being flexible. No, I had gluten-free brownies for dinner, so it's all good, Sarah. <laughs> oh, that sounds awesome. Now, if you eat gluten-free brownies, do you feel like you have less guilt because there's no gluten? Because I would eat them. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think there's less guilt involved. I think just a little bit less guilt. Are you a gluten-free person? No. Just oh. wanted something with less guilt. <laughs> okay, all right. But, if, but okay. Uh, you know what? I'm not even going to overthink this. 
I'm also yeah. going to have gluten-free brownies later, and I'm going to eat more than I should and say, but you they're gluten-free, so I don't have to feel as bad. Yeah. Exactly. Perfect. It's all good, Sarah. <laughs> all right. Uh, remember, you can find our show on iTunes. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TSH. We're all over the place. Amber and I will be back here next week with another episode of The Social Hour. Until then, have a great week, everybody. I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Amber MacArthur, and we'll see you soon.